looking forward to your talk again. Thanks. Professor Chinali, your mic is mute. Sorry, thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you for your comments on the books. Main, that were uh, multi-author books and many of the authors made the book and are here in the webinar. So uh, it is not my uh, merit, but just the merit of all the authors. Thank you for giving to me the opportunity to talk about external hydrocephalus in infants, a mysterious, mysterious, uh, so-called mysterious um, uh, condition that has so many synonyms. In fact, we should uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, external hydrocephalus, also known as idiopathic pericerebral swelling, pericerebral collections, benign enlargement of subarachnoid spaces, benign external hydrocephalus, uh, idiopathic external hydrocephalus, subarachnomegaly, familial macrocephaly, megalencephaly. All these synonyms have been uh, taken by the literature, and all of these uh, uh, synonymous for me are not good enough because uh, uh, idiopathic pericerebral swelling is not uh, means nothing. Pericerebral collections also is uh, not um, precise enough because there is also ventricular dilatation associated. Benign enlargement of the subarachnoid spaces, especially uh, unexact, because it is not always benign, and it is not only enlargement of the subarachnoid spaces because also ventricular dilatation is associated. Benign external hydrocephalus is uh, also insufficient and not precise because it is not always benign. Idiopathic means nothing. Subarachnomegaly is uh, not precise because there is also ventricular dilatation. Familial macrocephaly is uh, good, but it's extremely large. And megalencephaly also is a very archaic uh, way of calling this condition. So I, want, I am very happy to go back to the old uh, name of external hydrocephalus, and I will call this condition as external hydrocephalus that goes back to the root of the uh, word of hydrocephalus, excess of the fluid inside the brain, inside the, uh, inside the head. Uh, it is distributed between the subarachnoid spaces and the ventricular space in the most of the cases. Uh, these are also other synonyms. It is an infant condition between 0 4 out of 1,000 live births. That means half of all hydrocephalic patients. So it is very, very uh, diffuse. It is uh, probably the largest uh, um, uh, etiological condition for excess of fluid inside the head. It is characterized by progressive microcrania with widening of the subarachnoid spaces and associated with non-progressive ventricular dilatation. A two to one male female ratio, much more frequent in male, 80% of familiarity, and the multifactorial model of inheritance has been proposed by Arbor in 1996. Frequently associated with motor delay, 32% according with Holtz and 43% according with Marucha and uh, more uh, precise uh, evaluation are uh, these two very recent ones can have surgical implication. That's why I don't call any more uh, benign this condition. And the 12% will develop, in fact, subdural hygroma, according to the very recent paper from Holst in 2022. Uh, the pathophysiological theory is there is an old legend uh, that is the, due to the immaturity of pacuniae granulation, but uh, I will definitely call this a legend that should be definitely forgotten and uh, disregarded. And the uh, other theory that is uh, growing uh, and uh, apporting uh, increasing evidence is that this is due to the increased venous outflow resistance due to dural sinus strictures or stenosis or agenesis. And uh, this theory was uh, firstly proposed by Harold Portnoy and uh, Croissant in uh, 1978. And uh, the uh, second part of the title, as you can see in this very old paper, is the possible role of increased dural sinus pressure. These authors were doing invasive measurement and the perfusion of the uh, CSF uh, and they were uh, able to indirect measure the uh, sagittal sinus pressure uh, values and in seven of these 
cases, he, they found um, in all cases significantly higher sagittal sinus pressure if compared to the control. I think that there is a lot of noise in the, um, in the uh, underground. Maybe someone can close probably the microphone. Thank you. And so the sagittal sinus pressure was uh, high in uh, all of these patients and even quite high in all these patients. And they also did all the study that is uh, very rare to do now, that is the cisternography. And they also found that there was a prolonged retention of isotope over the convexities at 72 hours. So we must remember that this paper that is uh, uh, quite neglected and uh, uh, remains a, a very many important point because it was the first and only invasive in vivo indirect measurement of sagittal sinus pressure in patients with external hydrocephalus. It has been measured invasively in uh, by Christian St. Rose some year later, but not in patients with external hydrocephalus, only in achondroplastic and uh, syndromic craniosynostosis. So this is a very important point for this condition for external hydrocephalus. And according to their words from Portnoy, remember that in these children, there is a high opening pressure of the arachnoid villi or high sagittal sinus pressure or both. And uh, this is a very clear sentence. Since the absorption rate is normal, it is unlikely yeah that the arachnoidal villi are abnormal, and most likely the defect is a high sagittal sinus pressure. And these were from Portnoy and Croissant. Then came the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. So then came the CT and MRI scan. We were, did a lot of uh, very nice anatomical studies. Portnoy and Croissant paper was lost and neglected under the many acquainted and curious volume of forgotten lore, according to the citation from uh, Edgar Allan Poole. And invasive CSF dynamic studies in children have been confined to very few departments. And there, there was finally in these years of lack of evidences, the rise and glory of the legend of immaturity arachnoid villi. I, I hope you don't hear the same uh, sound that comes back to me of people talking. I hope sorry, you can understand Prof. clearly. Prof. Uh, yes, but, sorry, sorry, but I don't know. I understand that. Please um, uh, mute your microphones, please. Thanks. I understand this can happen. No problem. I it's just I hope you 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 can understand what I say. Yeah. Then came the now very nice paper from uh, Bateman and Napier in six cases that were kind of quite confused etiology because one had uh, subdural hematomas, three had meningitis, one had prematurity. But these authors were the very first one to notice that this patient had very significant strictures at the level of the at the level of the. Uh, 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 transverse sinuses and at the level of the dural sinuses of the posterior fossa. Then the very nice paper from Science and Schumann showing that their, this patient had strictures at the level of the uh, um, sigmoid and transverse sinuses. They did uh, a scale to evaluate this and they correlated the gradient of the venous obstruction to the uh, amount of CSF collected in the subarachnoid spaces of the literature. They also found and demonstrated that some, in some cases, after subdural or subarachnoid shunting, the strictures were able to somehow regress after um, uh, this, uh, after shunting. That is uh, something that is very well known after ventricular shunting, but uh, has been also shown in uh, these cases. So uh, under these uh, evidences, uh, we our objective since 2006 was to evaluate the anatomical variation of dural sinuses in children with external hydrocephalus, proposing a radiological grading of progressive anatomical restriction to the venous outflow based on PC uh, MR venography to evaluate the relation between position of plagiocephaly and dural sinus patencies, and to compare these findings with the control group to ascertain the role of anatomical restriction to venous outflow in the pathophysiology of external hydrocephalus. That was a retrospective study since 2006. We started to do MRI and MR venography to all these patients. 97 patients were accumulated with external hydrocephalus. The inclusion criteria were the age less than 20 months, had circumference uh, around 98% percentile, typical enlargement of subarachnoid spaces of neuroimaging, at least one venographic studied, and the exclusion criteria was the current sinusosis, of course, achondroplasia, and availability of MR venography. These results were compared to a control group of 75 patients, matching the inclusion criteria for age and available MR venography sequences. 
these are the head circumferences of the boys. These are the head circumferences of the girl. They were truly macrocranial, and no one of these patients had a subdural hygroma. So they were really pure external hydrocephalus patient. The reduction of patency of the dural sinuses were classified for each side as a grade one. If only a stenosis, a reduction of the caliber was evident. Grade two, if there was a complete stop in the signal of the uh, dural okay. sinus. And grade three, instead, if there was a complete uh, agenesis, congenital agenesis of the uh, dural sinuses. According to this, we created this uh, gradient system. Uh, the grade one, there was a one only uh, unilateral stenosis. A grade two, there was either a complete stop or the bilateral stenosis. A grade three, the two possibilities, either a uh, complete stop and the contralateral stenosis, other complete agenesis, then a grade four a bilateral stop or unilateral agenesis plus stenosis, and so on, grade five, uh, uh, summing up uh, three plus two, and grade six, uh, where there were a complete bilateral agenesis of both transverse sinus, this is most serious level of uh, venous uh, restriction. And this is the grading that was uh, finally created. And these are some cases, perfectly normal cases, like in this case, where you can see both nice dural sinuses on both sides. Then uh, grade one, when you can have stenosis, so you can see different of stenosis. These are grade two with bilateral stenosis in the uh, up and or uh, complete obstruction in one uh, side. Then and also grade two where the uh, isolated stenosis of the sagittal sinus is present. Grade three, you see a unilateral stop and the contralateral stenosis or complete agenesis on one side and so on, the grade four and the di different types of grade five and grade six. So growing levels and growing evidence of uh, dural venous sinus strictures. And these are the very impressive con collateral circulation that can be observed in some cases. Then the ventricular and subarachnoid species were measured above the intercommissional plane using a segmentation software. And the position of plagiocephalus also was recorded and also the asymmetric tentorial herniation that is uh, quite frequent in uh, this patient. The results, of course, as expected, the subarachnoid space volume were significantly larger by definition if compared to control in this group of patients. And also the ventricular volume was significantly larger if compared to the control group of patients, indicating that it is not an only a uh, subarachnoid spaces pathology, but is also associated with the ventricular enlargement as well. The venous obstruction grading correlated positively with the, the volume of the uh, subarachnoid spaces, and this was significant. The higher the grading, the more important the volume of the subarachnoid space uh, enlargement, and this was a positive correlation. And we also saw that uh, comparing cases and control, and when we look at the uh, gravity of the um, uh, intracranial venous drainage obstruction, the highest degree of uh, um, obstruction were only present in the cases because only one control case had a grade five, but otherwise all the grade four, grade five and grade six were all concentrated in the, in the cases series. So a significant correlation was found between the presence of venous drainage alteration and the diagnosis of pericerebral collection, indicating that there is a clear correlation between these two conditions. So the also significant correlation was also found in the case group between the grading of the vascular anomalies and the normalized subarachnoid space volume. And this was also significant. The higher the obstruction, the larger the subarachnoid spaces. So this was also an important finding. Postural plagiocephalus was also uh, um, uh, studied, and we had seen that on the side of the postural plagiocephaly, there was a significant correlation with the presence of a more important venous obstruction on the uh, postural plagiocephaly side. So that was probably an impact of the uh, plagiocephaly on the um, uh, development of the dural sinus. 
So the post pleasure cephaly was significantly more frequent in case group, and in uh, symmetric dural sinus anomalies, the most severe alteration were significantly associated with the flattened side of patient with post pleasure cephaly, both on the right and on the left side. And also this correlation was uh, highly uh, significant. So the first question came, why the infants with external hydrocephalus have such a high and significant rate of stenosis occlusion of venous dural sinuses? Uh, there are, of course, existing models in nature, as you all know, the achondroplasia and syndromic craniosynostosis. In this patient, the intracranial hypertension and the hydrocephalus are uh, correlated with the presence of a jugular foramen stenosis uh, due to the synostosis or precocious closure of the um, basal, uh, basal synchondrosis that delimitate the um, jugular foramen. So, uh, of course, there is a reason for this in these two pathologies but we have no reason for a jugular foramen stenosis in external hydrocephalus. Um, we also know that uh, on the basis of the experimental paper of uh, Christian Centros in 1994, we wanted to verify the hypothesis that the uni or bilateral jugular foramen stenosis could be at the origin of the significant dural venous sinuses alteration observed in external hydrocephalus in infants, and therefore be responsible of increased venous outflow resistance as the main pathophysiological factor of the diseases. Uh, so we studied this possibility. On the previous collected database, we were able to select 82 patients and 54 controls with a suitable MRI scan that was uh, possible to study. And we were able in uh, these patients to study the size of the jugular foramen on the, uh, according to the uh, uh, method uh, validated by Calandrelli in 2017, studying the jugular foramen of uh, um, uh, of achondroplasia. There is not only necessity of uh, uh, a CT scan because uh, jugular foramen can be adequately studied also on MRI sequence, and very clearly the size can be uh, um, evaluated. The sequence selected was such sagittal 3D PCMR. Uh, jugular foramen areas were measured on multiplanar action reconstruction, and the areas was measured between the posterior temporal bone and the jugular tubercle of the exiput of the uh, occipital bone uh, medially. Uh, this is one example of a measurement. Three neuroradiologists studied this. JFR were measured twice, two weeks apart by two neuroradiologists with at least 10 years of experience. Intraclass correlation coefficient was measured, and also the intraoperative reproducibility was studied according to strict radiology. Um, uh, statistical methods, uh, venous uh, uh, obstruction grade score was ranked from 0 to 6 according with the validated grading that we had described previously that is published in Child Nervous System in 2021. The age of the patient for the patient was 15.2 uh, and uh, for the control was 13.9, no statistically difficult and significantly uh, differences. Male female ratio was uh, uh, significantly um, in favor of uh, males for the patient if compared to the control according with the uh, typical um, distribution of the disease. Intra and interoperatory reproducibility was uh, um, excellent both for intra and interoperatory. So this was a very reliable measurement. And finally, we found that the mean jugular foramen area in the controls with external hydrocephalus was significant significantly small, sorry, in the control in the patient with external hydrocephalus was significantly smaller if compared to control. And this was significant even for the mean jugular foramen, but more strikingly, the smaller jugular foramen area was even more significantly smaller in external hydrocephalus if compared to control, given the physiological asymmetry between the left and the right. The smaller jugular foramen was uh, typically significantly smaller than the smaller one of the controls. Also, the postural plagiocephaly played a role on jugular foramen size and the jugular size development. Jugular foramen was significantly smaller on the plagiocephalic side, and also the venous obstruction was significantly higher on the plagiocephalic side. So probably also the postural and the plagiocephalic and the flattening of the posterior part of the skull played a role in the development in the size of jugular foramen and of the uh, uh, dural sinus uh, anatomy, as it was uh, clear in uh, many of our uh, patients. So this is a discussion.
there is a significantly jugular foramen stenosis in patients affected by external hydrocephalus. And this is a fact that is statistically significantly demonstrated by our study. The CT aspect of the petrooccipital synchondrosis is the next step to study, but it looks normal at the preliminary review. Whether this is the cause or consequence of the significant dural sinus obstruction remains a matter of philosophical debate, uh, of course, because if we take into consideration the uh, previous model of achondroplasia and synostosis, we must consider that there could be a very strong correlation and uh, um, a pathogenetic uh, mechanism that brings to the uh, to the dural sinus stenosis, and of course, further genetical study will be done in the uh, FGR, MGFR gene pathways study because this is the same study that is affected in um, achondroplasia and um, craniosynostosis. So the discussion and the uh, hypothetic. Uh, uh, pathophysiological mechanism is that the primary jugular foramen stenosis bring to the stenosis of the posterior fossa dural sinuses with increased venous outflow resistance. Uh, increased venous outflow resistance can bring to dilatation of the ventricle and the dilatation of the subarachnoid spaces, and this brings to progressive macronicrania with this cascade of uh, events. But why this happens around four, five, six months of age? Because uh, this is uh, um, intriguing. Why the macrocrania occurs abruptly around four, six months of age and almost abruptly stabilizes around 18 months of age and head circumference grows, peace glow, normalizes until three years of age. So why there is this uh, same uh, very, very steep growth in the first six months and then slowing and adaptation like in the achondroplastic child. So why it is uh, this happening? This is probably due to the arterial blood flow. Arterial blood flow that was studied in a chondroplastic patient has shown a steep increase of the cerebral blood flow between six and 18 months of age. Look at how quick and fast is uh, the increase in the cerebral blood flow uh, around six, uh, 10 months of age because of the growing brain in uh, that part of the life. And then the flattening and the stabilization of the cerebral blood flow between the first and the fifth years of age. This is probably the, the biphasic, biphasic um, uh, phase biphasic mechanism that brings to the rapid increase of the head circumference and the followed by stabilization after 18 months of age. And this is even more evident in the reconstruction that was done by Bateman and Napier, a steep increase of cerebral blood flow followed by a decrease in stabilization. This steep increase goes to meet a stenosis. This steep increase in blood flow goes to meet the stenotic and atresic dural venous sinus system drainage. And so this brings to uh, uh, stagnation of uh, um, uh, fluid in the subarachnoid spaces, increased venous outflow resistance, macrocrania, and external hydrocephalus. So in conclusion, there is a significant jugular foramen stenosis in patients affected by external hydrocephalus. This anomaly is very likely responsible for dural sinus stenosis obstruction venous hypertension, and external hydrocephalus, physiological variation in cerebral blood flow between six months and five years of age may explain the self-limitation of microcrania like in the achondroplasia, and the cause of the jugular foramen stenosis is still unknown. FGFR gene and petrochipital synchondrosis will be studied nextly in our uh, line of study. I have to thank uh, all these guys, Giuliana Di Martino, Carmela, Federica, Adriana, Eugenio, Stefano, and Mario for their dedication to this study and the whole Department of Neurosciences of Santo Bono Posilipo Children's Hospital in Naples, Italy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sinali. That was a fantastic and fascinating talk. Um, I'm just going to invite, first of all, um, uh, Professor Ricardo uh, Santos Oliveira. Uh, to comment and ask questions, then Dr. Jalo and then Prof. Dio Puja. But uh, you know, please, uh, from the participants and the senior attendees, if you want to make comments or questions, please just say that I want to ask question on the chat box and or put your hands up and I will open your mic. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Ricardo, please. Thank you, Pep. Thank you for this 
I think that was the most clearly talk that I listened in my life according to external hydrocephalus. It was very, very, uh, no, really, really, thank you. Thank you for this explanation. It was really, thank really you. clear. Thank you, Ricardo. Yeah. Pepe, uh, uh, in fact, I, I, I checked two questions for you. The first is, did you find some correlation between the side of the stenosis, the venous stenosis, and the subdural collection? So is there some correlation? No. Sorry, statistical correlation? No. No. Yeah. Uh, the, it's a subarachnoid collection. Uh, all the subdural uh, collection were excluded, of course. Uh, we are talking about the subarachnoid collection, but uh, they were, in all cases, very, uh, very sy symmetrical. Very symmetrical without any uh, any uh, uh, pre predominance of side. Okay, and my and my other question, of course, was exactly uh, what you said. What you said in the in the in the end of your talk so about talk? how uh, most of cases <laughs> you can see an uh, instability. So it's a maybe could be a transitory situation and you you explain us that it was probably uh, an adaptation of the blood flow uh, in, in those uh, infants did you have some uh, children that we studied after two or three four or five years uh, just to compare if the this venous um, this venous finding that you that you showed in the MRI, it changed according to the life in those children, or it it is it stay uh, at the same at the same time. It, it, it means uh, yeah. the anatomical uh, changement is uh, is a, is a transitory as the functional blood flow as you show or. It's really an anatomical uh, variation of those children. Uh, the, yeah, thank you for the question. I, I had no time to talk about that. It is reported in the first paper that was published in 2021. There were approximately uh, 15 patients that were, had uh, successive uh, MRI studies during life, and there is no clear pattern of evolution. There were uh, one third of the patients that were significantly worsened in their uh, stenosis uh, and obstruction anatomically. There were patients that were absolutely the same and there were patients who improved. And that was approximately 30% each group of patients. So it is absolutely uh, unpredictable and not, the, the, not clearly defined pattern of uh, evolution. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ricardo. George, can I please? Hey, bring you? Thanks, Pepe. I mean, incredible talk. I mean, it's 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 changed how um, we should probably manage these children with the uh, external, you know, these external fluid collections. How do you manage them? Uh, you know, how, given <laughs> what you've what you've learned today, and how yeah. should we manage them? Uh, because I can tell you, you know. Um, in the United States, most of us say, oh, you know, we get it. We see the child say, external hydrocephalus, do nothing. We'll see you back in a couple of years, if that. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. It's an excellent question. And uh, uh, most, the vast majority of the 97 patients that we studied were not operated. I think we, we were obliged to put a lumboperitoneal drainage in one case who had a papilledema, very uh, strange and uh, severe cases, and uh, but be only because he had a papilledema. Okay. And uh, uh, we were obliged to uh, operate, I think, uh, two cases who developed uh, subdural hygroma. Uh, but otherwise, we were very conservative, extremely conservative, although these patients are frequently associated with a very... Uh, um, worrying situation sometimes these patients have a very significant axial hypotonia they have a motor delay in up to one third of the cases and we found complete agreement with the literature so this explains the fact that in in some countries uh, and uh, there is a clear uh, clear um, 
evidence of the fact that in some countries, these patients are operated. These patients are operated up to 30, 40 percent of surgical indication. And this is a risk because the surgical indications varies from zero in some countries and some uh, series up to 30, 35, 40 percent in other papers. And this is uh, uh, incredible. This is incredible because this explains the confusion that there is in these uh, patients. Most patients are uh, misdiagnosed between uh, pure external hydrocephalus and the subdural collection. And uh, we uh, talk about, uh, and of course, the two pathologies are completely different, of course, because uh, there is a subdural collection. Uh, they are associated with bleeding. They are associated with the uh, shaking baby syndrome. So the, mas the most important problem, I think, is a clear definition of the disease. That's why we have to talk about external hydrocephalus. We had to completely abandon and to separate this patient from the subdural hygromas because subdural is not subarachnoid, it's completely different. Subdural can evolve, can be symptomatic, can bleed, and frequently require, uh, uh, frequently require uh, subdural peritoneal shunting in our practice. But pure external hydrocephalus in uh, more than 95% of the, our patients did not require any surgery. I, unfortunately, I have no long-term studies of this patient, but there are very good ones in the literature who say that some degree of a psychomotor retardation, psych not retardation, but psychomotor uh, neurodevelopmental delay remains in up to 15% of these patients. That's why I don't call this benign, because this is not benign. I mean, this is an external hydrocephalus. I explained this to the parents. There is no uh, there is no uh, indicated uh, solution, surgical solution in this patient because we cannot put a shunt or lumboperitoneal shunt to all of them. It is absolutely ridiculous. There is no indication. But we know that 15% of them will evolve to subdural hygroma and 10-15% of them will have some delay in the neurodevelopmental uh, development. So uh, it is uh, how do you manage them? the question, the answer is, I don't know. I still have to find a solution. But for the moment, I am very conservative. No, thank you very much. And Pepe, question I have is, do you obtain the vascular studies on all these children? Or should should we be getting these vascular studies on these children? This is another good question. I am doing that in all cases, uh, and but I have no suggestion to do. It's uh, There is no... There is no policy so far, but for okay. too many, uh, uh, we we do in any case, certainly we do a, a, an MRI study to all progressive macrocrania. So once you decide that you uh, have to do an MRI study, why not to do an MR venography sequence? It's just uh, three minutes and a half in addition to a, a 25 minutes exam. So once you decide that your patient requires uh, to be uh, to to have a narcosis for the MRI, then it is easy to add uh, MR venography sequence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, George. Professor Dio Pujari, please. Uh, so, Pepe, I mean, you've shown some very nice data about uh, correlation. What bothers me is the fact that uh, this, of course, occurs in older uh, children and uh, adults. But most of the venous sinus stenosis or venous hypertension results into what we used to call benign, but uh, as we know, it's not so benign, but intracranial hypertension with papillidine. And uh, what you are uh, I mean, proposing is that it causes... Uh, the subdural collections, as well as you have said in the same kind of algorithm which you have put, ventricular dilatation. So my question is, uh, why do you think it happens in young children, uh, such a young children? And secondly, have you always had hydrocephalus associated with the, because hydrocephalus first you said, and then you said uh, external hydrocephalus. 
So Thank how you. commonly have you seen increased ventricular size in uh, these patients? Thank you. Thank you for the question. The, the big difference, of course, between the uh, external hydrocephalus and the, the uh, so-called benign uh, intracranial hypertension in adults, of course, are the sutures, because uh, uh, in the first year of age, the sutures are open, your skull can enlarge, and the interstitial pressure of the, um, of the brain can expand, so you have the possibility for ventricle to expand. And you don't have this in closed suture, because when you have a stenosis uh, that occurs at 15 years of age, 20 years of age, your skull is completely uh, closed. You have an increase in the venous pressure. You have an increase in the interstitial pressure in the brain. You have a decreased brain compliance, and you have an increase in the uh, intracranial pressure without any ventricular dilatation. So this is the big difference. The big, uh, the the opening of the uh, sutures makes the big difference between the two uh, uh, the two conditions. And Hardy Kate is here, and uh, he dedicated all his life to explain the role of uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the intra uh, intra uh, sagittal pressure and of the uh, sagittal sinus pressure and of the venous pressure and the difference in children yeah. and adults. And I hope you can and confirm what I say, but I mean, all what we say is based on the studies of people like uh, Harry Kate and, uh, and uh, Portnoy that I cited earlier. Uh, but how frequently did you find ventricular dilatation with the external hydrocephalus? 35%. The other thing is, uh, did you do any special studies to differentiate between subdural and external, uh, subdural collection and external hydrocephalus? Uh, or uh, just MRI, uh, uh, yeah yeah MRI sequences now can uh, high definition and high contrast uh, uh, the CIS BFFE Fiesta drive I mean every machine has his own high contrast sequences volumetric millimetric cuts you can do very very clear differentiation between uh, subdural and uh, uh, subarachnoid uh, collection and uh, there is no more excuse now in a uh, wrong definition you cannot talk about subdural system yeah 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 you, you either you talk about subdural collection either you talk about subarachnoid collection and this must be done by neuroradiologists pediatric neuroradiologists and uh, this must be done very clearly and very clearly specified on the radiological report because there is no more excuse for confusing these two conditions now Thank you, Professor. Great. Thank you, Professor Dio Pujari. Um, uh, Mr. Shalendra Magdum, uh, uh, can I please bring you to ask your question? He's from Oxford. Thanks. Hi. Thank you. Great talk. I think this this talk really kind of uh, uh, gives an eye opening of the things to think about in the future about these cases and. Uh, uh, looking at uh, what your experience is, uh, it, it is some of these cases do present with papillary edema. And I have, um, instead of doing a lumbar puncture, treated with a course of acetazolamide for three to six months, which has kind of controlled the papillary edema and the pressure. And then after that, it has resolved on its own. Second question to you is that um, if you see some of the cases where the venous sinuses are not narrow, but there is a high pressure system down south, which means that the right atrial pressure is high. Uh, how, how many of these have you encountered? Because if you get uh, the uh, right to left shunts with uh, venous hypertension, you tend to also see these cases, which, which are rare, but they can be present as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you for remembering this uh, possibility. Uh, and in fact, acetazolamide is the uh, only, uh, as far as I know, the only medication that clearly decreases the uh, CSF production by 30%, according to the literature. So uh, it is certainly an option, as well, the uh, lumbar puncture in order to manage uh, acute uh, uh, people, acute presentation with papilledema and association of lumbar puncture and azotazolamide is an option for uh, before taking the decision of shunting. So certainly this is an option. And uh, um, it is it can be effective. I have no experience in that, 
unfortunately, and I have not the, the lucky experience you had in your case. Uh, my case uh, with that we tried to manage with the lumbar puncture was the case that finally ended up in lumboperitoneal shunting. And uh, he resolved the papilledema with the lumboperitoneal shunting, but had incredible amount of complication related to the lumboperitoneal shunting. So uh, uh, think very, very well before shunting these patients because it's <laughs> it's really, they can uh, lead to a, a slit ventricle syndrome due to the high venous pressure and due to the um, uh, high decreased compliance of the brain parenchyma. So uh, try and whatever you can. Yeah. And secondary care is later on. Yeah, so yeah. Somebody is asking the dose of estrozolamide. It's in the in in the the British National Formulary. You have to start it at eight milligram per kilogram in divided doses, and then you can slowly increase it to get a uh, get a good response. Monitoring the blood uh, for electrolytes in about six to eight weeks time. Yes, yes. The the the, the, the problem is that of course you cannot do di uh, acetazolamide uh, throughout life, and uh, it is uh, it is reported that there are some. Uh, uh, con kidney complications. Mm -hmm. So on, uh, it is rare. I have never seen that, but uh, this can happen. So, so, and unfortunately, the most frequent okay. problem in acetazolamide is that it's not uh, the dosage of the acetazolamide is not high enough, as you say. That the you have to start as progressively, but you have to increase to uh, to to adequate adequate uh, dosage. And frequently, people stop before this dosage, so it is not as effective as it could be. Thank you. And just to mention on the acetazolamide, I'm glad uh, Mr. Magdum uh, has found it safe, but uh, I have mainly used it in NPH patients and none of them, most of them didn't tolerate. And it has got a lot of uh, side effects as well um, uh, in terms of kidney, in terms of um, hyperchloremic acidosis. So yeah. you have to be careful with um, acetazolamide. Uh, Mr. El Gamal, uh, you have got a question, I think. Um, Dr. Elgamal was asking, uh, I think you mentioned it, the relation between extraaxial fluid and grade of sinus abnormality. That's them. Yes. That's brilliant. And uh, uh, Dr. Mukherjee is asking a good question. I think you mentioned that uh, the benign is a misnomer. Do you think, uh, just de de developing from that point, do you think there's a two different, there's a benign one and a non-benign one, or do you think it just needs more more um, examination to see whether it is, uh, you know, th those those cases where there's no uh, sinus stenosis, whether they are related to something else or whether they are benign. Well, you know, it's uh, it's like in every natural phenomenon, you have a, a Gaussian distribution. So you have the light cases and the serious cases. Yeah. And uh, to oh, also uh, reconfirm, reconfirm the... Reconfirm what say to George Allo. That's why I prefer to perform an MRI with an MR venography to all these children, because you know not only you are sure of the anatomy of your collection, you are sure of the grading of your venous obstruction, and this can add elements to your clinical decision. Thank you, Doctor Riquet. Uh, can I invite you to make your thoughts and comments? Um, you go. You know, one of your area of interest, as Professor Dio Bujari was mentioning, is subcortical CSF. Uh, it would be great to have your thoughts on what Professor Sinali has mentioned. I enjoyed that conversation very well. I think it was uh, well done. Um, yes, I think that the very few patients need uh, any involvement. Um, it's It would be nice to be able to control the venous system um, better, I think. Uh, um, I appreciate these the remembrance of uh, the difference between the, vein, the veins. I um, I wonder if um, the stenting uh, of the uh, veins um, is still being used. Um, it, it was a big thing um, five years ago or so, but I don't hear anything about it now for these uh, problems of venous uh, failure in uh, um, in these with the CSF uh, problems. Um, 
I am. I, I just wonder. I, I come to hear to new to hear new things, and I find it, and I appreciate what you're doing, and I think that this has been very good so far. Thank you. Thank you all. I think that uh, the, the the venous stenting uh, certainly has some indication in uh, in adults intracranial uh, benign uh, intracranial hypertension. Uh, I have no uh, not not in this pathology. As far as I know, I have no uh, any notion in the literature of any attempt to treat this condition that is uh, still remain uh, relatively uh, relatively. Uh, acceptable condition and that does not require treatment so it uh, probably we will never have any uh, nor uh, intra uh, sinus uh, pressure measurement not measurement across the gradient of the obstruction in this kind of children i don't think so not with the actual uh, technology that we have one of the things that uh, you didn't talk about and i thought it a very good talk was um, the effect of the fontanelles or the um, head, uh, how big the head is. Um, isn't that, uh, is that anything having to do with your uh, analysis? The size of the head, you mean? Yeah, the, uh, the, in the, in the, yeah, the, the, the oh. yeah, yeah, there was a, uh, there was a correlation, uh, there was a correlation between the, the venous uh, outflow uh, grading score and the amount of CSF that was, of course, correlated with the with the overall volume of the head. Of course, that that, that was an intuitive correlation, so that was not nothing surprising. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it you was great you. to see you all. <laughs> nice to see you too. <laughs> Hope to see you soon. Really. Sure, sure. In Toronto, <laughs> certainly, certainly. <laughs> I will. I'll do that. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Booth. Can I please invite you to um, uh, share your thoughts, uh, questions to Professor Chinnam. Oh, well, thank you. I, Pepe, I, I would agree this is the best talk on this subject I ever heard, and it's the second time I've heard you give it. I, I always learn something. I would make uh, a couple of comments. We do see this clinical picture in children with uh, superior vena cava syndrome or with elevated right heart pressure. Clinically, you can differentiate the two at the bedside because the children with vena cava syndrome or right heart failure have distended jugular veins in the neck, whereas these children don't. And that should be a clue that you need to look at the heart. Um, and then to Hal's point, in our country, nowadays keeping them away from endovascular interventionists, this is a horrible age to put a stent in children because then they get anticoagulated and these kids are constantly hitting their head, constantly falling. So it's a dangerous combination. But thank uh, congratulations. Yes. You're Excellent. right. Thank, th thank you for talking about the superior vena cava syndrome. The difference between the, these, uh, why the superior vena cava syndrome gives rise to a, a progressive real hydrocephalus that always requires shunting is that both the uh, external jugular vein and internal jugular vein are uh, interested by the superior vena cava syndrome. Uh, whereas in the external hydrocephalus, it is only the internal jugular vein that is interested and the collateral circulation, compensatory circulation develops through the external uh, jugular vein uh, system. So uh, that's why these patients do not probably, probably these patients do not develop uh, uh, hydrocephalus like in the superior vena cava syndrome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Boop. Thank you very much, Professor Sinali. It's a fantastic talk, and um, and we had great discussions. And if that's okay with you, you can let me know later on. I can once again post the lecture on our YouTube channel. What you can think about it. But thank you very much. Learned a lot. Cheers.